I would like to introduce you to this very embryonic approach to um, a dialogue between degrowth and other uh, discourses in line with the alternatives, alternative developments or alternatives to development discussion worldwide. Um, I'm not very sure how this exactly fits this session here. We're kind of zooming violently out now from a very, very grassroots, practical, on the ground perspective in the first presentation through a sort of dual um, grassroots and also kind of seeking to institutionalize a movement perspective to this very, very abstract, as you can see from the title, the synergies towards a great transformation. So we're taking this, this big perspective. Um, and we're trying to approach this uh, from the perspective of discourses which come into dialogue with each other and how they can mutually reinforce each other. What are the weaknesses of each and how can the other discourses jump in to complement in a fruitful way this, this, uh, these weaknesses. Um, where it does fit well, uh, this, 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 this topic, um, is with the plenary discussion of last night. Uh, I assume many of you attended, um, where the question was raised, how can we connect Global North and Global South uh, to, to, to make their interdependencies visible? And that degrowth will not achieve this desired transformation as long as it focuses only on uh, the Global North and its problems and patterns. Uh, it needs this, this cross-pollination with uh, with the views, the, 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 the themes that resonate in the Global South, and so on and so forth, and vice versa. Yeah? So this is, this is our just a few ideas in how, in which way, we think this could be made fruitful. Yeah, I didn't present it. Uh, we're working on this uh, in a group of six people. <laughs> Can you go back to the slide before? Yeah, these are all of us, and it's not just the two of us, it's, it's all these uh, two of them are sitting here. <laughs> and there's also one from OK, uh, the three discourses we are considering are uh, degrowth, of course, uh, when we live, as uh, an interesting and quite well-known experiment going on in Latin America at the moment, um, and human development, which is obviously much less transformative, uh, nonetheless opens a certain space for discussion and um, has gained the mainstream, so to speak, and so far becomes interesting uh, as a partner in this dialogue, in our view. Very good. So, uh, no, back right uh, <laughs> So, uh, as Miriam Lang was posing last night, I just want to revisit this idea because it's very interesting for us also. Uh, there is no need to convince each other of, of one's own concepts. Uh, it's more about um, taking each other into account, seeing each other when thinking of strategies. So this is our approach, and we would like to raise the bar a bit further even and say it's not only about seeing each other, but also considering each other's potential partners in this strategy development. Uh, so as I said, this is a work in progress, so please be condescending <laughs> with us. Uh, okay, now you can move to the next, thank you. So very quickly, and also I want to hold this short because I know we're running late. Um, so basically, I, I've, the next three slides are structured uh, in the same way. It's presenting each of the three discourses I mentioned, degrowth, when we will, and uh, human development. Uh, trying to summarize what the roots of this discourse were, uh, what its context of emergence looked like, um, what the actors pushing it forward are, and what the key contributions are. So now I would like to zoom to the key contributions because I think this is enough for uh, us to see the, get the big picture and engage in some discussion now. So, uh, in the case of degrowth, it's the most familiar to all of us, probably. Um, we see, in the context of this dialogue, within, between these three discourses, or among these three discourses, uh, the main contributions being the centrality of questions about pre the prevalent socioeconomic model. So it's about, well, I know it's not only, uh, but in our interest here is to highlight the discussions about the material structure, structural uh, barriers to, uh, to this great transformation to to materialize. Uh, and the generation of proposals, concrete proposals, policy proposals, depending on which strand of degrowth we are uh, 
we're focusing the proposals will be more bottom up or more top down, more institutional or more grassroots. This is variable. Uh, but there is this, this, this package of proposals which could be technically feasible to implement tomorrow, yeah, today. <laughs> In the case of um, Bon Vivir, just for those who are not familiar with it at all, uh, it's a very big movement which, which um, arise from the grassroots, from indigenous grassroots movements and peasant movements in the Andean Amazonian countries in Latin America, uh, with the decisive influence, I have to stress, from um, international cooperation organizations, uh, development cooperation organizations, uh, which opened up this, this, uh, this uh, dialogical um, channel between North and South uh, from its very genesis. Uh, and then it was taken up by the state. Uh, maybe some analogy with Syriza could be in place. The state then, uh, of course, uh, as part of an actor in this international order, world order we are living in, um, could not implement these ideas coming from the grassroots. Could not, would not, didn't want to uh, mix with all these things. Uh, the fact is, uh, as a state project, in my personal opinion, it can be visualized as a failure already, um, but the important and the, the, the rich thing for me is the cultural transformation that it uh, unleashed in, in the society of these countries, especially Ecuador and Bolivia. Um, and the state did play a pivotal function, function in sort of raising the torch of this Buen Vivir and making it visible. So that much we have to, to credit the state for. Um, and yeah, as I, as I was saying, it offers sort of this kind of real lab experiment at a macro level. Uh, which which makes it interesting. Julia, please. Um, lastly, uh, human development is also pretty familiar to all of us through the work of the UNDP and its human development report since the 1990s. We know it's, a, as I, as I uh, try to summarize here, it's a system imminent critique, and so far it does not really question the market-based uh, Western liberal democratic framework, um, but it does open a debate on the multidimensionality of human well-being uh, and gives a central road to the freedom of choice and public deliberation in this definition of what human well-being is about. Uh, and as I said in the beginning, it has permeated the mainstream development thinking and policy making, um, which makes it for us a potential strategic partner in channeling much of our discussions towards the mainstream. This question was raised multiple times in the conference, as, as I've noticed already. How do we get from this closed system here of degrowth thinkers to society at large? Um, and there are, of course, potential. There are also dangers in trying to prematurely institutionalize the, 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 the degrowth movement and compete in the political arena because it, it drifts very rapidly into, into you know, the political game uh, and loses contact with the reality and the radicality of the critique. So um, there could be some, um, hopefully, potential for contamination of already established institutions by this, things, this uh, type of liberal thinking <coughs> via the, um, the um, human development approach to development policy. Good. So, in the last slide, did I keep it short? Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I tried to summarize the, 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 the discussion of how these three discourses can interact most fruitfully. I also revisit the, or uh, draw on the, on the expression that Miriam Lang used last night, uh, make complementarity fertile. Yeah. Uh, and I try to structure it very simply, each of the discourses, what are the strengths and the weaknesses, or the Achilles heel, I, I need it here, um, and try to see how they, the, how they complement each other. This is actually not the right visualization for this, it should be rather visualized as a triangle with, with uh, reciprocities in, in all directions, or maybe even a circle. Um, so, okay, quickly. Overview. We propose that uh, the relative strengths of these three discourses are Buen Vivir in the front of a cultural transformation, 
degrowth in the front of a material structural transformation, which doesn't mean that degrowth has not a, a, a very strong component of cultural critique. Uh, don't get me wrong. And human development as a key to a political transformation in the sense that it, it, it's already uh, established, an established approach. So and how, how, how do they play with each other or complement each other? Well, when Vivir opens the dialogue of knowledges between traditions which were heard to considered as incompatible with each other, namely the development outlook, yeah, this linear theory of modernity, and uh, the, there is a, a couple of stages of, of development, and all countries have to pass through the same stages, we know that. Um, with these uh, more traditional approaches from indigenous communities, at some point this, this linear development idea got into a big crisis worldwide, uh, late 80s, and the development community itself sought to revalidate the development discourse through drawing from uh, traditional views, such as in this case the indigenous views in, in Latin America. And the result of this, of this uh, strange alliance was when we did. Um, so it offers sort of an external vantage point for a critique of Euro-Atlantic modernity, if you wish. Uh, which is some, some uh, which is which is one aspect of the cultural critique that degrowth does not address necessarily, or not centrally. Yeah. Um, but it also has an Achilles heel, as I mentioned, uh, and that's that it rapidly hits the structural barriers, which are not really considered, are not internalized in in the one degree discourse. So one degree does not offer solutions, mechanisms, and a, a, a sophisticated analysis of how to go about this this transformation the economic matrix. It just denounces that as a problem, this post-extractivist matrix that was also mentioned by Uli Brandt last night, uh, but it does not show us how to deal with it. So that, that's where degrowth can, can um, jump in and provide with tools to do exactly that. Um, as I say, it provides a deep understanding of mechanisms, of the mechanisms locking in contemporary capitalist economies into the growth path, proposes a number of technical programmatic measures of Varying ideological inspiration, which is also an interesting feature of degrowth, doesn't didn't come to the forefront too much in this conference, but I think it's a it's an important thing to stress. I don't know if you know about this, but in Germany there is even a conservative strand of the degrowth discourse. So uh, it's really right wing uh, degrowth, uh, which is a strange thing, but interesting nonetheless, since it opens these avenues for uh, for dialogue. Um, the cultural critique that degrowth poses is, is more reduced than the one that when you poses, but resonates nonetheless. So there's also complementarity and, and synergy there, and affinity. Uh, and what we identify as an Achilles heel of degrowth is the, well, it's, it's a triple one. <laughs> On the one hand, the lack of political leverage. So are we going to, 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 to found a degrowth party and, and play the, the political game? And, and, and run the same destiny as Syriza? I well, personally don't think that's the right uh, strategy to, to go for. Uh, the, yeah, that's, that, that's actually the second thing, danger of diluting to the political game. And the third thing is the danger of Eurocentrism, which has been criticized often in, in, in the framework of this conference. So that's where these two can complement each other well. <laughs> but also this. Um, if you, if you consider this, this lack of political leverage and the fact that going for a premature institutionalization of this and trying to go and play there in the political front is not a good idea. If we share this diagnosis, which we ne don't necessarily will have to, um, then this becomes a viable option to, as I say, try to influence this, this, this political sphere without compromising the critical capacity and the mobilizing capacity and the grassroots connections of, of uh, the degrowth movement. Why? Because, uh, as I said, um, human development did permit the mainstream development thinking and policy making already. Uh, because it does par talk particularly well with one of the strands in the degrowth critique, namely the liberal uh, reformist trend, uh, which focuses on institutional change. Um, and has a very particular focus on sufficiency policy, for example. Um, and uh, I, I used here, I draw on, on Krista Richteris, um idea of right to sufficiency. 
I think this is a very good example of how these two things can complement each other and dock. Um, because if you consider what is the central thing in human development, it's the thing of the right to decide what means well-being for me yeah, or for a community. And Christa Richter poses the fact that uh, people wanting to live more sufficiently are actually not free to do so because we are sort of trapped in this, in this hamster wheel of, of consumerism. Uh, and you cannot really get out of it. There are structural obstacles to do that. So if you pose sufficiency as a matter, not as a matter of restrictions, not, not as a matter of asceticism, but as a, as a matter of right, I want to have the right to be this, you're actually talking in the language of human development. This is just an example of how these two things could, could, uh, could complement each other. Um, yeah, of course, the Achilles heel has already been mentioned. It's not a system critique, it's not a systemic critique, it's a system imminent critique. And so far it needs necessarily the contamination of these other two, otherwise we will just stay where we are. Um, yeah, so this is basically the, 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 this triangle circle. Sorry not to have uh, visualized it that way, um, which we wanted to introduce to you how to, how, to, how to combine these ideas. And last slide is just to thank you for listening, um, <laughs> welcoming you for proposing uh, questions. And shortly, a, a little promotional thing. Um, we have this academic blog, Alternautas, which is aimed exactly at contributing to this North South dialogue. Uh, in that we um, traduce, translate into English discussions about development alternatives and alternatives to development going on in Latin America, which do not really cross the, the borders of the Spanish speaking world because of uh, the language barrier. So we're trying to contribute in this regard. We've just released a new issue, um, so you can visit us and, and, and participate. Participate also in the discussions. Thank you very much again. And Thank you for giving time. Where are you based, Jonah? Based, Jonah? No, where are you? Sorry. Ah, where were we based? Uh, ah, good question. Uh, sorry. <laughs> 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 uh, Shulene is uh, based in, well, you can introduce yeah. yourself. I'm based in Chile. Okay. Yeah, and I'm based in, uh, right now, doing my PhD in Berlin, okay. uh, but I'm also research associate to Flaxo Argentina. So I'm Argentine. Mm -hmm. We have five minutes for questions, so. <laughs> no questions? Okay. Yeah. That really had a, I just got to, perhaps I missed it, but um, what again made you choose the three? And did you, in your, in your work, uh, perhaps come across others that might have been more useful or that you will include in the next step? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very good question. And I, I should. And why always this Latin American bias in the in the debate? It has failed because you say it has failed as a state project. Perhaps it's yeah. time to look at others. Yeah. Good questions. Um, uh, regarding, should I answer or okay. uh, regarding the first one? You didn't miss, and I did not mention it actually. Um, <laughs> it has two reasons. One is a very pragmatic one. Uh, we are six people. Uh, we are paired in two, two, two. And each of the two pairs is, is more or less expert in one of the discourses, so we just, you know, we put them together and, okay, is there, is there a sensitive way of talking about the dialogue within, between the three? And we found there was, so we did it. Uh, definitely there are many other discourses which play a, a more, may, maybe a much bigger role in, 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 in how should I say it, um, in helping these this articulations to, to, to materialize. Uh, I don't know, I'm thinking of conviviality, of the uh, commons movement, of uh, social solidarity economy, and so on and so forth. Uh, definitely, this is it's not aimed at being exclusive at all. Uh, it's, it was more of a pragmatic choice. Uh, and to your second question, um, yes, I did, I did acknowledge uh, a failure at the, at the level of a state program, but I also pose here the potential of when we uh, as a matter of cultural transformation, not as a matter of you know, the state programmatic interventions uh, which are successful at, at, at changing things. So I think in that, in that sense, it's still very valid and, uh, and there's a lot of, I mean, I think we cannot, we should not miss the opportunity to, it's not, it's not every day that we get an experiment in, in radical uh, development rethinking at the macro scale. 
So I think it's, it's worth uh, sticking with it for a while, at least. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, actually, can I follow up on following from what you're saying on the on one of the other? Just, um, I mean, describe it, you, you describe it as a, as a failure. I guess it's a failure in terms of people. Yeah. Um, but um, I mean, they're having. Uh, I'm not familiar with Bolivia as much as the Ecuador, but in Ecuador, they're having quite a lot of improvements for people's lives in terms of you know, poverty reduction and education. And, and perhaps it is. Perhaps there are. I mean, my question is, I guess, sort of, do you think it's do you think it's a step towards <coughs> something positive in that space, or do you think actually it is a Were you there last night at the closing no, session, or no, you weren't? I was in, I, I couldn't hear it, I was in Simpler, and the video was making. Well, <laughs> uh, I invite you to, to visit uh, Miriam Lang's presentation, who is the, the director of Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung in Quito, Ecuador. Uh, she answered to this question very, very convincingly. Um, first of all, these achievements are being reversed now. So there were kind of shallow, you know, statistical achievements in reduction of poverty, but at the same time they undermined uh, a sustainable reduction in poverty. So now that uh, that commodity prices are down, these things are are, are going backwards. Um, and uh, on the other hand, it's it's fixing one thing while it's worsening the other, and the two are interconnected. And this doesn't seem to be acknowledged. Um, you can read Eduardo Gudinas, for example. He makes a very strong case for. Uh, for, for the, the oxymoron of, 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 of Correa's um, argument that he will use extractivism to get out of extractivism. Because <laughs> you're locking yourself into a, into a path uh, which you cannot, I mean, it's, once, you, once you put the Frankenstein out there, you, you, cannot, you cannot control it, you know? Um, so that's, that's, I think, what happened in Ecuador. Yes, it's true, of course, there are certain indicators which are ranking much better than they were uh, 15 years ago or 10 years ago even. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, not, I'm quite spe skeptical of it. I have a question on. Yeah, um, my question is quite related. Um, I wasn't there last night as well, so I don't know if this is talked about that. Earlier in the debate, um, Bolivia said that it was going to be the first country to reduce its poverty by 2030. Yeah. Um, and Bolivia has been quite active in that regard. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's a very relevant question. Um, there are m multiple entry points to, to the answer to this question. Um, first of all, I would have to say that um, it's true, when Bibir is a, is a translation from, well, in Quechua it's Suma Kausai, but there are many other uh, indigenous languages which have similar concepts uh, in their own language, the Mapuches, the, the Guaranis, uh, the Aymaras, all of them have, have, have their own, uh, when Bibir in their own language. Um, but the funny thing is, many researchers which, which have gone deeper into this, much deeper than, 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 than us, um, they, they found out that actually Suma Kausai or Nyandereko or Kumemongen um, um, uh, or all these indigenous expressions did actually also not exist before as such. Suma Kausai uh, is also an, uh, a neologism. Uh, the ideas contained in Suma Kausai are not invented. They, 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 they actually draw on the indigenous traditions. But this idea of summa causa is something opposed, you know, as the alter ego of, of Western development. Uh, this, this was not there before. Mm -hmm. uh, it's true, there, there are different strands in this. Bombivir is also a discursive field with multiple, uh, multiple sub-discourses. And uh, in our research, we have identified mainly three. There is this state-centric state state um, strand, which emphasizes very much um, the, the indicators that, that you were pointing out, yeah, that's development. Uh, when we read is about, you know, achieving better standards in terms of classical Western style uh, development parameters. Um, there is uh, an academic strand which is much more development critical and drawing on the post development tradition, ecological economics tradition, so on and so forth. Uh, and there is an indigenous strand where many people pose exactly this, this argument. Mm -hmm. We we try to place these three strands in a continuum of, you know, uh, universalism, 
versus particularism in terms of, of um, worldviews and, and, and uh, epistemologies. Uh, and we find that both the poles, both the, the particularist one, which is the indigenous, which want, which aim at essentializing a view of the indigenous, yeah, uh, uh, in terms of a mythical past which, which probably never existed, yeah, and, and, and claiming that they want to jump out altogether uh, of, 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 of the modern uh, ontology, uh, as well as the ones who are equalizing uh, Buen Vivir with, with development, just um, with better uh, achievements in terms of, of uh, poverty reduction, uh, education, health, and so on, uh, both are actually unsuitable for, for, for fertilizing this debate. Mm -hmm. uh, because if you want to, I mean, speaking today of dropping out of modernity altogether is kind of a self-defeating argument. Because even in the indigenous communities, there are many people who don't want to. Who, they can't even think of, of 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 how indigenous communities were before modernity uh, arrived in, in South America. Because, you know, there is no there is no linkage. There is no yeah. You know, in the genealogy, there is no linkage. And culture they, is always re reinterpreted. So. Yeah, culture is a living thing, right? So they're they're trying to live according to their ideals and their traditions, but they're living today. And today they're, in, they're inserted into this uh, modern matrix, so it's difficult. And of course, the other, the universalist poll, uh, well, it's nothing new, so it's really not, not very fertile. So we, we propose a pluralist approach to, to the one Bivir debate, where both things have a place, and uh, they can learn from each other, right? That's the... the um. Yeah, yeah, isn't uh, uh, Perea and Morales too, I think, both, but they're in a transitional phase. They were left with an extraction of this neoliberal economy from the prior administration. So they're trying to transition out of it. They're making hard choices. Uh, it seems to me that Lynn Bevere would, would be an overall framework that they use to, I, to, to determine what is, what is beneficial to their communities in terms of the choices they make in terms of all consumption. And so as they transition into a degrowth economy, for example, they're making a choice between what Western values they want to adopt that are exploitive or not exploitive and, and try to focus on those that are not exploitive within the, the overall framework of DV. So it, it, I don't see them as being on equal levels, I guess is what I'm saying. One, one forms a philosophical framework for the direction of their, of their community and the other one that defines the choices that they make within the uh, market economy. Mm. You, you mean the two, uh, Correa's and Morales not being equal? In, in no, 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 no. I'm just saying that when you talk about the choice, when you said that uh, you, you commented on how Correa was using extractivism to get out of it. Yeah. Well, he's using extractivism to get out of the neoliberal uh, trap that he was left with. Yes, he And well, let me give you an example, like, like the your Sunni project that he had. Yeah. You know, that, that was a proposal. You, maybe you want to say how that would integrate with them as, you know, a proposal that would yeah. uh, certainly be a degrowth proposal and one that would fall within the concepts of BB. Yes. And, but at the same time, address the situation that they were left with and, and that this entire economy was based on extractivism. Yeah. And, and so then how, so I guess what I'm saying is I don't see that you really talked about this being a transitional process about how you go from a society that is based on, on a capitalist economy into one that is that is based on one that is healthy and, and uh, you know, people-oriented. Yeah. Um, I think I, I got your point now. If I, if I didn't, please uh, no. correct me. Um, I think we, we can also not you know, take Korea or Morales and say, OK, this is Korea, A, B, C, D. Uh, this has also been an, an evolutionary process uh, in their outlook, in their discourse, in their in the relationships to the grassroots, etc., etc. So the Yasuni Tete initiative, I don't know if, if, if that rings a bell to, to most of you, was an initiative um, proposed by, well, was born out of the grassroots, taken up by the Korea government, uh, which proposed to leave the oil under the ground in a triangle formed uh, by three cities uh, within the Yasuni National Park, which is a biosphere reserve. <coughs> Um, so he did in Rio plus 20, he did uh, 
present this initiative to the international community um, as an exchange. He said, okay, uh, we're ready to leave this all on the ground and so far the international community is ready to compensate us for 50% of the revenues we would have gotten if we had taken this oil out of the ground. Uh, so this initiative found good reception at the beginning uh, in many countries, um, got quite uh, some important support in some European countries uh, for, for a time being, um, and then uh, it did not reach even 10% of the revenues expected, and it was cancelled in 2013 in August. So, and then Korea said, okay, the international community, the, the world is not ready for, for yes, we did it. So we have no other choice but take this oil out and, you know, and, and continue uh, providing for our population's needs. This, this, this is the short uh, framework, or the short version of the yes, we need it, the history. Now, um, first of all, the constitution of Ecuador forbids from taking this type of decisions unless you got the consent of the local populations affected. The government rejected to, to, to ask the, the local populations if they agreed with this. Um, second of all, the revenues from this oil thing are not being invested in any transformative type of projects. They're just being invested in cash transfers uh, to, to, the, to the, the, the truly true to the marginalized sectors, historically marginalized sectors of the population. But just to give them, you know, in education, for example, it's not about uh, changing the curricula, it's about getting computers into the classrooms. Uh, it's about giving you uh, cash so that you can integrate yourself better into the consumer um, uh, community. So, I mean, if you would say, okay, we're taking some money and, 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 and are sacrificing uh, to an extent certain ecological objectives to invest in transformative type of, of, of uh, policies or of initiatives, then I could agree with you. But I don't see this as being the case at all in Ecuador. Not right now. And now all the bases, the grassroots bases who supported Korea to get uh, to power has, has completely... Uh, rejected his his policy view. No, I, I agree with you. Yeah. Um, I urge you to, to um, continue the debate on this uh, the, this presentation during the lunch, so that we can yeah. hear the last panelists. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.